Hey gang, it's your boy. And as you may have heard, Samuel Opoku, the alleged Toronto turd tosser, was granted bail on December 23rd. And I'm not at all surprised. Well, I was, briefly. But then I started looking into things further and quickly lost that sense of naivety. And as a result, any remaining faith I may have had in my province's criminal justice system. But more on that later. First, let's check in with the most special of crime specialists, CP24's Steve Ryan, and the rest of the characters that comprise this rancid spectacle. And breaking news from the courts this hour, the man accused of dumping feces on people at York and U of T last month has been released on bail. For more, let's go live to CP24's Steve Ryan on this court appearance today. Steve? Gah! What color is that coat, Steve? Is that is that salmon? No, it's it's Dusty Rose. <sighs> Steve, I take back everything I ever said about you having a sense of style. Big B Lupo, you were right, man. How did I not see that? Chanel, this bail hearing started at around 2.15 this, mor this afternoon, I should say. Come on, Steve, get it right. And it just ended. Both the Crown and the defense made some pretty compelling uh, submissions to the Justice of the Peace. But at the end of the day, the Justice of the Peace found that uh, bail is not punishment. Well, I'm not at all surprised that she reached that conclusion, considering who this Justice of the Peace is, but we'll get to that. And that if certain conditions are met, people are entitled to bail. So, Apoko has been released on uh, strict bail conditions, meaning that he's got to see his doctor, he's got to remain on medications, and he's got to continue seeking counseling. It was very long, very detailed uh, uh, description as to what transpired inside the courtroom. But the bottom line is, uh, Apoku will be released, and we were expecting to hear from his lawyer in the next 10 minutes or so. So once he comes out, we will scrum with him. <laughs> You're gonna what with him, Steve? Jesus. So Steve, I know that there is a publication ban. There's not a whole lot you can say, but can you talk about his demeanor in court today? Yeah, he sat in the box, basically had his head down for the most part, uh, did, did not look up. So yes, you're right. I wish I could tell you about the evidence because it's uh, unbelievable evidence, but we cannot talk about that. Yeah, I wish you could tell me more about it too, Steve. God, this publication ban's giving me the worst blue balls ever. Um, th the whole idea, though, of this bail hearing was to see w whether or not he would be released. And two hours into that bail hearing, he is going to be released with conditions, and he will walk out of this uh, courthouse probably within the next couple of hours. So, Steve, what happens next now? I mean, this is a pretty unorthodox, an unorthodox type of case. Unorthodox? Wow. Everybody's got marbles in their mouths today. Um, and very public, mm -hmm. too, as we mentioned. Released on bail today. What, what's the next step here? Well, he's due back in court on December the 23rd. And on that date, he needs to prove to the court that he has visited his doctor and that he's on his medications. He will be in breach of that court order if, in fact, on the 23rd, he comes back and advises that he hasn't taken his meds or if he doesn't show up. So the 23rd of December will be the next important court date, and I expect at that time we'll get more information. Now, all commentary on his attire aside, through further research for this video, I discovered just how integral our boy Steve was to the apprehension of the accused. As this overtly compassionate Sun article from November 28th pointed out, being a former homicide detective with the Toronto Police Department, Steve actually hit the streets with the closed circuit stills that were released to the public. And found the man who identified Opoku from the homeless shelter where he was later located and taken into custody. A minute ago, Steve briefly stated some of the conditions for his release, but the full conditions are as follows. $1,000 bail, without a surety. That he not contact any of the victims. That he not possess weapons and not visit the locations of the attacks. I should mention that in Ontario, more often than not, bail amounts are simply promised to be paid if the conditions aren't met, so the court likely hasn't received any bail money. Also, considering the weapons in this case are buckets of liquefied waste, is he not allowed to own a bucket? Or allowed to go poo? 
Seems a bit odd in this circumstance, especially for this Justice of the Peace to agree to, as we'll see later. Steve also indicated that he was ordered to return to mental health court on Monday, December 26, to prove he's taking any required medical treatments, which he did. And here's a brief clip of Mr. Weiss after that appearance. Obviously, I'm, it's constrained what I can, unfortunately, share. Yes, yes, Jordan, we know you can't say a goddamn thing. But I can, I can say the following. Mr. Poku is doing very well. I think it's clear that he's certainly doing a lot better than he was a week, two weeks, three weeks ago. Oh, I'm sure he's doing so much better now that he's dumped all that feces on those unsuspecting Asians. Got it out of his system, one might say. Uh, things are improving for him. Things are improving in terms of his uh, mental condition. And hopefully uh, everyone will be able to move on to the extent that that's possible. Difficult, obviously, for the alleged victims. But uh, this hopefully will just be a terrible chapter and the entire city hopefully can move on. Yes, I'm sure you'd like everyone to just forget about your client's case and move on right about now. But let's hear a little more from Mr. Wise about how things went immediately after the bail hearing, with what I'm sure will be some hard-hitting questions from Steve. You made some pretty compelling arguments with regards to uh, having uh, your client released. Uh, your thoughts on, uh, on the whole process? Well, that was a bit of a softball. Well, the, the, the process actually shows uh, that uh, the judicial system works right and that those accused of crimes, even crimes that are rightly considered to be repulsive, if, if they can put a plan together that is meaningful and comprehensive, that... Uh, t -t -t Today, Junior! ...establishes... Uh, that there's no significant risk to the community, then the judge does the right thing, which is to release, because bail court isn't the court to decide penalties. So it sounds like everyone at this point is parroting the bail judge's words. Bail court is a court that determines prior to trial whether somebody uh, can be released into the community and that the community at the same time can be safe and the courts and the crowns and the defense council all work together in a very sober and reflective and careful and considered way and we'll see why that's the way they do it in a bit and we are very glad and relieved that the judge agreed with us today is the public protected man with those softballs steve what's up well uh, i can't say the public is protected because not because i don't think it i think they are just the non-Asian portion of the population, I assume. But that's not my role. My role is to put together a plan that, in my view, is one that the public can be confident in, and I think I've done that today. So at this point, some lesser journalist asks Mr. Weiss if his client is fit to stand trial. Right, well, let me just be clear that fitness is not a very onerous standard. Somebody can be fit to stand trial, which just means they understand in the most rudimentary way what's going on around them. It's not a high threshold. Uh, that's not the same thing as what's referred to as NCR, not criminally responsible. That's a very different matter, as I'm sure the viewers appreciate. Will you be looking for NCR? Attention? Wow, the lesser journalist comes correct with a good follow-up question. Start taking some notes, Steve. Well, we'd have to look at all the documentation in order to make a determination as to whether that's viable. But as I've said previously, the allegations suggest that's, that that's a real possibility. With the conditions that were put on his release, um, do you think they're realistic? Are they hard for somebody to, to abide by the conditions? Because you talked about that quite articulately in court. I, I appreciate you asking that. We were very, very careful. And I, I appreciate that you, you saw that. Now, I did intend to show you the entire post-bail trial scrum, but uh, it drags on like a tailpipe, and Steve's questions just get softer and softer. Anytime someone says, wow, I'm really glad you asked that question, it wasn't the right question to ask. And I guess the, the 23rd of December will be an important date because that's the date he's to return to court and advise the court whether or not he's been complying with his conditions. So that's, that's an important date, correct? That's a really, I'm glad you asked that as well. That's a really important date. We brought him back on December 23rd. Now, I'd, I'd rather be on December 23rd 
you know, tossing back brown brandy in front of a fireplace. I don't really want to go to court on December 23rd. I mean, I'd, I'd rather have a day or two to rest. It's really fucking with your Hanukkah, huh? It's right before the holidays. It's too bad. What's more important is my client, and what's more important is the assurance at the earliest possible opportunity that uh, the risk to the community can continue to be managed and my client uh, gets whatever treatment he may require. The guy's got to stop hitting the bathroom for a couple lines before he comes out for these televised scrums. It's not a good look, kid. So if you're like me, you may be wondering what kind of a fucking idiot would let this photographed fecophile back into the midst of the very public he terrorized after proving himself to be a flagrant abuser of the probation he was granted for his 2017 criminal molestation conviction in Hamilton, Ontario. Would it surprise you to hear that it's an activist intersectional feminist appointed to her position by this Mr. Bean looking liberal motherfucker and rubber stamped by this diversity hire? Yeah, neither am I. I present to you Her Worship, Justice of the Peace, Rhonda Rafi. And yes, that is her actual title, and these are the only pictures of her I could find. This champion of the women's and other marginalized groups has spoken up quite publicly about her disdain for Crown attorneys attaching conditions to bail, unless you're a group of women in her court with pro-life beliefs. In that case, you're just trash deserving of her mockery. You see, back in 2016, another activist justice of the peace, Julie Lawson, wrote an article in the National Post lamenting that Crown prosecutors were actually doing their jobs attaching conditions to offering bail for accused individuals which resulted in an ongoing disciplinary hearing. Her worship, Rhonda Rafi, was one of a gaggle of justices that offered testimony in defense and support of Lawson's position at one of her hearing appearances. These femtards, who we pay over $130,000 a year to let some objectively violent and disturbed people back into the fold of our communities, would like to do so on an even more unfettered basis than they already are. But none of this would be even possible if not for the guidelines set for Crown prosecutors and attorneys in 2016 by Yasir Navki, the Attorney General under the Kathleen Wynne Liberal Provincial Government. I would be remiss not to mention that former Premier Wynne, shown here, forced to sit in a corner of a Toronto mosque during a PR visit because the men were praying, whew, is a good friend of blackface wearing, two-term Prime Minister and continuing national embarrassment, Justin Trudeau. The guidelines mandated by Wynne through Navki gave support and guidance to Crown attorneys on exercising their discretion at bail hearings regarding certain groups who are classified as low risk, being vulnerable by virtue of their mental health or addiction issues, or if they are indigenous or <coughs> racialized. This policy urges the Crown to consider the unique circumstances facing marginalized groups, including people of color, the homeless, and those suffering from mental illness. Like I said before, gang, given that Opoku ticks all three of those oppression checkboxes, I'm no longer surprised he's out on bail, given the fertile environment and soft bigotry of low expectations made possible by the current federal and former provincial liberal governments. So now that we're at the bottom of that rabbit hole, I'd just like to remind everyone that social justice reforms don't bring about actual justice. They just give us these kinds of conditions. When you play stupid games like the Oppression Olympics, you win some pretty stupid prizes. And Steve, I know it may have sounded like I was being a little tough on you this time around, but you really weren't on your game, bruh. We like it when you play hardball. Maybe it's time to ditch the pink coat and get back to those fly double-breasted pimp suits. Just saying. And with all that being said, there's not much left to cover with this case, barring any surprise developments or non-consensual scat showers until next month. But until next time, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out my links below on how to support the channel and follow me on social media. And I've been your boy, Richard Rizzo. Peace out.